today we're going to look at the concept of deconstructivism as it applies in architecture, product design and graphic design. Right? So what we're going to look at, as you can see from this slide, right, which you're now looking at, I hope, and that is looking at what, what deconstructivism is, where it comes from, its history in architecture and graphic design. Right? Let's move on. Uh, now, this first slide is just an attempt to separate two different historical periods, all right, at their simplest. This is an advertising graphic design from the 19th century. And this is graphic design from the early 20th century, right? Now, as you can see here, it's packed with um, allusions and all sorts of different images and text all mixed together, you know, into a, a single, you know, complicated, not complex, but complicated image, all right? But by the time you get to the 20th century, what has happened is a form of specialization of the function. The text is neatly divided up and placed on its own. The images are then also placed on their own. What you're getting is a kind, it's a kind of functionalism which we will get to quite soon. All right? So let's move on there. Now, let's look at where deconstructivism comes from. All styles. And decon is a style. Let's not get it wrong here. All styles have origins in you know, some kind of previous manifestation. All right? In this case, what we're looking here at is this. Early modernism. All right? The heroic period. The white architecture as it was known, right? By those who liked it, that is. Okay. Early modernism is 1917 to 1950. Right? And that's the white architecture. Its intellectual basis, right, was formed by several people, including, you know, Le Corbusier and Mies van der Rohe and, and whoever else, okay? Mendelssohn and so on and so on. But the intellectual center of the thing was in this design school, this German design school called the Bauhaus. And its key and fundamental aspect, you know, of modernism for design was the idea of functionalism. Right? In other words, the object, the object is basically a map of its functions, if you see what I mean. In other words, there are no extraneous stylistic or historical elements involved. It simply almost grew out of its functions. This is not true, of course, right? But it's what the, their propaganda exercise and their uh, approach to design was. In other words, now that we've got rid of all the stylistic elements of the 19th century, the neo-Gothic and the neo-Baroque and the neo-classical or whatever, right? Once you got rid of all that kind of stylistic baggage, all you had left was the program, the brief, right? The function of the building. And that had to be translated directly into the shape of the building as such. Right? That's the theory then. Modernism from 50 to 70 is simply high modernism. Right? It's application right across the world and a whole range of different building types and project types and graphic design as well and product design. Right? That's when you really see it in real action. But there was a reaction to that. It, this will come up, I will show you this. There was a reaction to that kind of modernism. Right? And that reaction set in in the 1970s and was titled, for better or worse, it was titled as post-modernism. Right? Post, after, after modernism, whatever. Right? Deconstructivism is part of this post-modern, anti-modern trend. Okay, that happened starting in the 70s. And it has now become, to be honest with you, a full-blown style. A full-blown style, like modernism. Now, I use the word style. It may sound superficial, but it's not. Style is a language, right? When you look at buildings, you know, they are derived from a language of uh, selecting elements and coupling them together into a statement. That statement can be a building, all right? But there are several different languages, as we will see. Okay? And deconstructivism is one of them. First, we have a look at modernism. 
as a philosophy, as a concept of design, as an approach to design, right? And its essential fundamental aspect of functionalism as the basis for the form of any building or indeed of any graphic work or product design. Right? The fundamental philosophical basis of, of uh, modernism is in this, is the idea, the belief in science, progress, order, right? as against the chaos and the historical baggage of the 19th century. Logic and calculation. In other words, you could work out from the brief, from the, the project itself, the needs, if you like, of the project, you could work out what the form of the building was going to be. You couldn't actually, but we're only talking about their view of what they were doing, right? And the other aspect of it, of course, is analysis and functionalism. All problems, according to the modern philosophy, all problems could be reduced to their fundamental elements. If you could do that, you could analyze each one of them and then recouple them together into a given and more appropriate, more useful, useful, a more useful form than original. Okay? So the idea of functionalism here is based on analysis of the problem and then recoupling the little answers that you get into a single product or building. In doing so, it inevitably reduces experience to small bits, small, easily analyzed bits. And also, it relies on something else. It relies on statistics. All right? and as the number of people who do this kind of thing can then be, you can then produce a kind of theory or a form that suits those people for most of the time. Okay. There's another aspect, of course, and that's the reduction of personal experience. There's no longer any subjectivity in these issues. That's the theory anyway. In other words, it all comes out of a precise analysis of a large group of phenomena. Okay. This is why I have put up this image by Geiger, the designer of Geiger, that shows the machine, namely a gun, okay, and human beings being stacked into the chamber, ready to fire. Right? We're talking about the invention of a machine here, modernism. But it cannot be uh, uh, differentiated from technology. There is the modern technology, the technology of post-Second World War technology. Right? And of course, the full blown international capitalism also arose in the big corporations, right, that arose after the Second World War. Okay, here we go. Next. This is the kind of joke. In order to produce a unified, complete, statistically worked out form, a functionalist form, in a sense, you end up functionalizing people's experience and by implication functionalizing them standardizing people in other words so what we have here is the René Marie surrealist painter with this kind of joke of the world raining down standardized office workers okay? so modernism standardizes people in society and shapes them into a one size fits all Right? That one size is determined by functionalism, by analysis. Okay? And it rejects, in theory, it rejects the real complexity of things. Not all people are different. Not all problems are different. Okay? But a lot of them are. Okay? Econ, along with other movements, which we will see, okay, rejects this kind of standardized approach to modern society. Right? What we have here, what I put up here is two different images of the world. One, one of course, is the, the modern image. Standardized, mechanical, mass-produced, that whole kind of thing. An essentially simple view of life, where most people do the same thing most of the time. This is the 
postmodern image of life, namely that life is complicated, messy, terribly interesting. Okay? Even so, right? And that is this. So, we can say by the 1970s that modernism was suffering attacks on the way it was designing the environment, the buildings, the graphics, whatever else, right? And part of that attack, part of that attack, right, that comes from modernism, comes from, it's called deconstructivism, which we'll get to, okay? But the point about the postmodern period is an attempt to get back to the idea of complexity in the environment, that the environment should reflect, in fact, more truthfully than modernism does, that the environment should reflect the actual complexity of lived experience. Okay? Next. You should realize that the attacks on, on, on modernism, high modernism, from the 20s to the 50s, high modernism, modernism and its products, are, 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 quite, are quite physical, they're quite concrete in a way. Um, the attacks, for instance, on mass housing, for instance, it's no surprise whatsoever that lots of the 1960s um, mass housing, a lot of them are now being blown up and removed, both in Europe and in the United States, right? Because of the kinds of brutal, frankly brutal environments that were produced during that time. The theory is this, that there has to be an alternative, or had to be an alternative, you know, to the modernist approach to design. There had to be, you know. There was more to life than this mass-produced and frankly alienating uh, approach to designing the environment, right? And in this case, what we have then is postmodernism attempts, and we will see how, attempts to move towards a reflection of diversity okay, and complexity. Right? In other words, there are more kinds of lifestyles, more kinds of people, more kinds of uh, uh, fashion approaches, architectural approaches. There's more to life than this. Right? There's lots of different ways of saying the same thing. Right? There's mass housing, but there are lots of different approaches to doing that. Right? Architecture. So I'll give you an example. So we're talking about mass housing, we could equally well talk about, you know, glass office towers, the corporate towers, all right, of the 1950s and up to the 1960s. Faceless glass boxes. That was the theory. Okay. In the main, corporate faceless glass boxes. Okay. So here we have an attempt to say, what is the alternative to that way of doing things? And of course, it's an attempt to reflect, because if design does anything, it's an attempt to reflect, to model actual experience, right? Now, if you take the, the view that experience is quite diverse and complex, then the end product will also be diverse and complex, all right? So, that's what we have. So, we have a diversity of opinions, explanations, and ideas. Right? Different ways of doing the same thing. And what, what are these different areas? What we can talk about in the 1970s, you get questions of identity. Identity in the sense of who you are, what your background is, what your culture is, what, which is different from somebody else's, and should be shown equal value or respect or whatever. Ethnicity, of course. Ethnicity, I deal with it in terms of culture. Okay, feminism in terms of you know, gender issues that arose, you know, and uh, there's also this anti-science approach to things. Anti-science in the sense of if science applied to the environment produced modernism, then there was something wrong with science and the way that it measured human experience in order to produce its product. And of course, what we're really looking for is individuality and subjectivity in 